Bingo, we're back. One o'clock rock. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're going to do research in Manoa. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, space mission operations uh, at UH Manoa with uh, Trevor Sorensen, professor of engineering in the Space Flight Lab there, which is uh, like a joint venture of SOAS, the School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology, and the College of Education at UH Manoa. Um, and wow, we've got them all together in the Space Flight Lab. And uh, he's working on a bunch of things we're going to find out today. Welcome to the show, Trevor. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. And I will just make one correction. It's the College of Engineering, not Education. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's yeah, okay. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> College of Engineering, of right. course. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, what is the Space Flight Lab and what does it do exactly? Okay, the Space Flight Lab was founded in 2007. Uh, between SOAS and the College of Engineering, and the purpose is to uh, develop satellites, launch and operate them, in particular satellites that can be used to test new technologies and further the research interests of the university, and in particular SOAS. And so I joined HSFL uh, in 2007, a few months after it started. Mm, okay. So um, tell us about your training. How did you get involved in space, for one thing? Well, I'm from Australia, and I uh, went to high school in the 1960s, and I got interested in rocketry. I built my own rockets out of steel, made my own propellant and everything, and I kept a scrapbook on all the early uh, space flights, uh, the uh, Gemini and, and Apollo uh, space flights. And uh, I started a rocket club in high school, and so uh, when I found out I had an opportunity to come to the United States after high school, I uh, naturally wanted to do aerospace engineering. And uh, at first, I, uh, my first job out of college was as an aircraft structural engineer, which I did not like that much, but once I got into grad school, I was able to get into uh, space, uh, space programs mission. Pioneer Venus was my first one, and I've been there ever since. <laughs> You're really involved in this, <laughs> I know. So um, you have a you have a, a a PhD in engineering. That's a rare degree, isn't it? Not many people take that degree. It's well, when I got my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering, and uh, I had no real intention of going on and getting uh, higher degrees except maybe a master's part-time. Uh, but uh, I, that was in the early 70s, mid-70s, and I was not a U.S. citizen at the time, and there was a big slump in the aerospace industry. And the job I had, I got laid off after six months, and I really couldn't find another job, so I was sort of forced to go to grad school. And I'm glad that happened, because then I went on and got my master's and doctor's degrees. Well, in, at some point along the way, you got involved in software, and you're involved now in software for these uh, space missions and satellites. Uh, and I, I, my big question, I told you before we started, but I don't have an answer yet, is what was the magic moment where you went from space engineering and aeronautics to software? Because that's a, a different ball game, isn't it? Uh, yes and no. Uh, a lot of engineering uses uh, software and programming. And probably the, the moment for me was uh, just before I started my last year of high school in Australia, we had a uh, one-week uh, math camp, I guess, at the University of Newcastle, which was the, the local university. And what city was that? Uh, Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia. Oh, New South Wales, okay. Yeah, it's about 100 miles north of Sydney mm -hmm. on the East Coast. And um, while uh, in that week they taught us the basics of Fortran programming and asked us the sort of the uh, uh, culmination of the week was to design or write a little program. And I, I wrote one to uh, simulate the flight of one of my rockets. And I loved that. I mean, it, it was great. And then when I got into uh, university uh, in, as a, uh, my bachelor's degree, there were opportunities to, to write programs. Uh, continued on into to grad school. My doctoral dissertation was to develop computer programs to determine the wind profile on Venus from the descent trajectories of the Pioneer Venus probes. 
And so, and, and that was written in Fortran as well. And also when I was in grad school, uh, for recreational reasons, I started designing my own Star Trek type game, which sort of uh, eventually in the 80s uh, grew into uh, a business. Uh, I became a, uh, the head of a company that published computer games. Ah, no kidding. And still today? Uh, well, that particular uh, enterprise uh, started in 1983. In 1990, we became a affiliated label of Electronic Arts and sold hundreds of thousands of games, yeah. uh, very popular. In 1990, there was a hostile takeover bid of my company, and I found that once lawyers get involved, the fun goes out of it. <laughs> and so I... You heard it here on Think Tank. <laughs> and so I sold my shares of stock and got out of it, and, and a couple years later, the company folded. It's a and, good time to get out of it, isn't it? <laughs> and I started up another company that was just to develop games, not actually publish them. And, and we had one game that was published before uh, that company went defunct. And, and I basically haven't done any gaming until about three years ago. Someone, one of my fans, contacted me and wanted to do an Android version of one of my games. And so I agreed, and uh, it was two years ago that uh, he completed, and, and it's now available through the uh, Play Store, Google Play Store. Really? What's the name of the game? It's called Starfleet Deluxe. For, Starfleet for the, Deluxe. Deluxe, okay. For the Android. And I can get that on my Android right yeah. now. Yeah, it'll cost you $1.99, but I, you, you I, can get it. I'll do that. <laughs> so, but you know, there's a relationship, and I'd like to explore that with you, between writing games about space and writing software that actually takes you into space. Yeah, th and, and actually, I, uh, in 1980, after I got my uh, doctor's degree, I got it in 79 through NASA Ames. My research was at NASA Ames. Then in 1980, I went to the NASA Johnson Space Center and worked as a guidance and control engineer there. And I... Uh, had several friends, one of which uh, became an astronaut later, but uh, engineering friends. We formed the company, and our primary goal was to write a space shuttle simulator game that was based on the actual way the space shuttle flew. And uh, since that still had to be developed and my Starfleet game had already been written and would take a lot less time to, to bring to market, we did that first, and as it turns out, we never did finish the space shuttle simulator, but did a lot in the, uh, the Starfleet and, and strategy games like that. And um, I was an assistant to the flight directors for the space shuttle, worked in mission control, and after uh, I'd done that for a while, which involved a lot of paperwork, and you know I felt like my my talents weren't being used uh, properly. And an opportunity came to be a task manager in the software engineering department uh, in support of the space shuttle. So I took that job and worked on the ascent design system and the space vehicle uh, design system uh, or dynamic simulator which the uh, NASA used for designing their shuttle flights. And so I was able to do my space engineering, but also get very involved in software at the same time. My experience is with business software, so it's a, it's a lot different. And you're writing in much more sophisticated languages like um, the Fortran, and, uh, which I guess is still alive, and, um, and C++. Right. Um, but what, what, what kinds of things can you do with your engineering and your software? What sort of functions does that all perform for a satellite or a space mission? Everything or some things? Well, you can start very uh, at the beginning with design. And uh, a lot of tools are now being developed that where before an engineer had to go in and uh, do hand calculations or with calculator uh, or even using small computer programs to do certain parts. Designing the, the, the space? Uh, all aspects of it. Uh, the analysis design, the, the aerodynamics, the propulsion, the, the mass and, and the uh, attitude dynamics, everything like that. 
uh, there have been programs starting to be developed that takes the burden off the engineer. You have tried and true algorithms that are used and, and where you can do what ifs for the design and run it in simulated flights and things like that. So it's a, been a great aid for the design. Uh, but of course, the actual operation of the uh, spacecraft, uh, in the older spacecraft, nearly everything was done on the ground. And there was not very limited intelligence on the spacecraft. But with the more capable microprocessors, et cetera, uh, more and more of the uh, intelligence and analysis and everything that has to be done is being done on board. And that's a benefit because it's right there, it's faster, and you don't have to rely on communications in order to do, do the processing. Yeah, and it became uh, particularly obvious with the, the deep space missions where you have such a large time lag, but even in uh, Earth orbiting where the time lag isn't the problem, you still have problems with outages or you don't have coverage because the satellite's not going right over a ground station. And there are targets of opportunity that uh, might be missed unless you can get an instant decision on the, uh, on the spacecraft. Yes, yes. So it helps the, the people who are piloting the spacecraft make instant decisions as they go through their routine. Um, but um, is the software we're talking about also navigational software where, you know, you're trying to get to a certain point and like, like you see in all the science fiction and, you know, you need to find your trajectory in order to get there? Yes, the, all aspects of it have actually uh, in the software now. The, the, that's the guidance navigation and control GNC portion that they, they call that. And more and more the spacecraft on board are being able to design their maneuvers. In, in the simple case for a low Earth orbiting satellite uh, or maybe a geosatellite, uh, they want to stay at a particular altitude. And so the onboard computer, especially thanks to GPS, knows where it is. And when it starts to wander out of where it's supposed to be, it can program in the, the burns and commands necessary to boost it back to be in position. And that can be done without any you know, uh, uh, contribution from the ground. That can be done autonomously, as they call it. One other question before we go to a break, and that is, um, does software written for, for spaceflight satellites too, um, does it have to be specially robust? Does it have to have backup systems? Does it have to have um, the ability to function even if parts of the platform or parts of the software aren't working properly? There's um, software in most engineering projects is often what they call the long pole in the tent. It's the part of an engineering project that is usually underestimated as to how long it's going to take and what the resources are. And no matter how thoroughly you test it, there seems like there's always that one bug in there that, that gets away until it bites you when you least need it. And uh, I worked on the, the manned space program, the, the space shuttle program, and where there's human life involved, it has to be very clean, robust software. And uh, like the space shuttle had five onboard computers. Uh, of course, when I was there, they were pretty primitive computers and small compared to but the idea what was now. to have redundancy. Yeah, and they would have four, four of them were identical with each other. And then they had a backup that uh, was written in a different language and, and by a different company. IBM did the first, the main four. And, but if there was a problem inherent to either the, the uh, uh, language or the algorithms that they used, it's, it would not affect the backup. The backup didn't have the capabilities of the primaries but it had enough for survival and mm. to be able to get the shuttle back down if mm. necessary. Mm. Mm. And they also had voting capability. You know, the, uh, uh, the primaries would vote. They'd, they'd each calculate something, and if one of them disagreed, it was thrown out. And so, so that was one way to ensure that uh, 
that a fault, a electronic fault in one of the computers didn't uh, cause a problem. That's fabulous, voting computers. We, we could use that um, <laughs> next Tuesday at Election yeah. Day, especially this year. Uh, that's Trevor uh, Sorensen. He's prof uh, a, a director of, uh, uh, excuse me, a doctor of engineering in the Hawaii Space Flight Lab, which is a, a partnership of the SOWEST organization, the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology, and the College of Engineering at UH Manoa. We'll be right back with more about what he's doing. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. We are the co-hosts of Keys to Success, which is live on Think Tech live streaming network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for a likable science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. Okay, we're back. We're live with uh, Trevor Sorensen. He's a doctor of engineering at the Space Flight Lab at UH Manoa. We're talking about the software that he's been developing for various uh, space flights. And I wanted to, I wanted to ask him to continue that for a moment. Um, um, you were talking about redundancy uh, in the case of space flights involving human life, and uh, one system is on what five separate computers. Um, but what else, what else is done for that? And how does that differ uh, when human life is not involved? Um, all the spacecraft that are, are launched, uh, with the exception of the, the small, very small CubeSats, which are about that big, but uh, most satellites that are launched uh, is uh, an investment of millions, in some case billions of dollars. Even if there is not uh, human life involved, there is still a need for a very reliable system that provides mission success. Otherwise, years of, of work and resources go down the drain. An investment. <laughs> and so uh, one of the, the problems that satellites and spacecraft face is radiation uh, in space. And uh, the, the more expensive spacecraft have specially rad hardened, there's radiation hardened parts that they use that are resistant mm. to radiation. Uh, you will also get shielding, generally uh, aluminum shielding that they'll put around critical electronics to that to block a lot of the radiation. Radiation can, can mess up a computer. Yes, definitely. And some of it is temporary, it'll just flip a bit or something like that. And there are uh, methods where they can scrub the, like a hard drive to determine if there's as something like that has happened. And, but there are times uh, when the radiation can uh, affect uh, a, one of the, the logic gates or something permanently, and you have to have a way to, to get around that because you can't fix it. So you have to reset, reboot it somehow. Well, there, there are a couple different ways. One is redundancy. You can have uh, you know, two onboard computers. And uh, if, if one does not work, then you can switch to the other one. And that's true for, for other parts in the uh, avionics. Uh, if the, uh, the com onboard computer freezes up for some reason, whether it's from radiation hits or, or whatever, then we say the computer crashed and we will do a reboot. And the reboot is from a uh, permanently stored software program that is on the, the computer in the uh, what they call the EEPROM and it will uh, enable the satellite to obtain basic functionality to be alive, communicate, uh, et cetera, with the ground and that will boot back up onto the computer so that the ground can troubleshoot and everything. They, the satellite often has uh, uh, 
RAM memory on board where if there have been any updates to the software, they're stored on that and then they will load that back in once the computer's up and running mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. And then that's, that's Try a Try to fairly, get back to the same level. Yeah, that, that's a, f a fairly common technique. What about updates in the software? Can you send updates like I get on, you know, I get from Microsoft all the time. Can you send them and, and, how, and, and sort of um, improve, uh, update the actual operating system? Um, as I told you, the, the software development is, lo is often the long pole in the tent. And I was involved with the Clementine Lunar mission uh, back in, which was launched in 1994. And we had a three week journey from the Earth to the Moon. And the purpose of the mission was to do a global map of the Moon, a digital global map of the Moon uh, over a period of two and a half months. Now, the software was not fully ready and tested. Uh, it was good enough to go into Earth orbit and send us to the moon, but we weren't ready to map the moon yet. And so we sent updates to the software on board the spacecraft, and we tested it out on the, the spacecraft so that by the time we got to the moon, we were able to start the, the mission. But even while we were doing the mission, and this is, is true for most spacecraft, especially early in their life, uh, problems were found. And so we'd send updates or what they call patches up to the spacecraft to fix particular problems. And, and actually, uh, Clementine was lost after it left the moon and was headed to Earth on a, a roundabout trajectory to the asteroid Geographus. And the, the reason it was lost was due to mostly to software. And uh, one of the patches that would have fixed it and prevented this was sent to it on the moon. Uh, but the patch had a lunar name on it. The, the, the name of the patch was lunar something or other. So after it left the moon, the computer crashed. And when they brought it back up, they put the patches on that were needed to bring it up to full level. But this particular one they thought was only needed for the moon, so they didn't update it to the spacecraft. However, they did put it on the version that was in the, the testbed simulator uh, back in our control center. And so when they tested a new script or a new experiment they were going to do, it worked perfectly in the testbed because it had this patch in. But on the spacecraft, it caused it basically to end the mission. Wow, how interesting. Wow, this is fascinating stuff. So let's talk about your current projects. Cosmos, uh, I recall one of them. And we have some graphics. Uh, why don't you tell us what you've been doing? OK, um, when I came to HSFL, my job was to uh, be a project manager to build our first satellite, which is going to be about a 100 kilogram satellite called uh, Hawaii Sat 1. And uh, we needed to be able to operate the satellite. And I uh, remembered back to my Clementine days, we developed a piece of software that worked very well for controlling our satellite. And so we decided to, to bring that over and use that for our current project in HSFL. And we uh, did a, uh, uh, the, we built a prototype of it and we submitted a proposal to NASA and they liked the idea of this uh, project. So they funded us for three years to develop Cosmos, which. Oh, there's uh, the logo for Cosmos. Yeah, which uh, stand, uh, stood at that time for the Comprehensive Open Architecture Space Mission Operations System or, or Cosmos. And we developed that over three, three and a half years and applied it to our projects. The, the follow-on to Hawaii Sat 1 was called Hiaka Sat, and it actually became the onboard software and the ground software. The ground station software was all controlled by, by Cosmos. And um, I, I'll just point out that the university thought that, that Cosmos had a lot of potential. So in 2014, they invited us to go, uh, enter their Accelerate UH program oh, sure. and do a, we were in the first, first cohort to start up a company to develop and market Cosmos. And we did that and the company is called Interstellar Technologies Incorporated. 
And uh, when we did that, we changed the name of Cosmos and the marketed version, which comes through Interstell, is called iCosmos, which is Interstell's comprehensive open architecture solution for mission operations systems. And one of the, the things you notice that in the change of acronym, we took the word space out because initially it was designed to control spacecraft and satellites. But uh, we were asked by a group in Canada that was doing a feasibility study for the Canadian Space Agency to join them, and they, they wanted to use Cosmos for their operating system, not just for their uh, spacecraft, but also for their lunar lander. And this was a micro rover mission, also for controlling the micro rover. So we altered the Cosmos design so that it wasn't limited to spacecraft, it could actually control anything, oh, any vehicle at all, whether UAV, rover, uh, rocket, satellite, ground station. So I was, I was going to ask you, and you've, you've kind of answered it, you know, if there is a possibility for commercialization of what you've been doing, and obviously there is. And, you, and what you're doing here in Hawaii is cutting edge, and other people with similar, mm, you know, space uh, enterprises uh, could use um, Cosmos or its successor. It's happening right now at UH in the accelerator. That's fabulous. Have you made a million billion yet? <laughs> no, we're, we have a, a lot of uh, uh, organizations and companies that are working with us and evaluating it. Uh, the, uh, some of them are in DOD, NASA Goddard, NASA Ames, uh, uh, and, and others are very interested in it mm -hmm. and so we're still in the infancy stages of getting it out into the market very promising though right here from uh Manoa. yeah fabulous and and one of the differences for cosmos over existing systems is that it's a nodal architecture in the fact that we interface with nodes and we don't really care what the node is whether it's a spacecraft uav or something and it and it all uh, flows into a comprehensive system. We have a plug-and-play architecture, which means that someone else's software can be interfaced into a Cosmos Makes it framework. modular, make, therefore yes. more marketable. And, and we've, we've taken a lot of attention to the user interface to make it very easy and intuitive to use, and that comes from my gaming, where I design computer games and uh, some of the, the things, like one of the computer games was uh, Planetary Invasion, where you had to keep track of a number of planetary uh, invasion zones, and, and you had a lot of information to keep track of, which is very similar to having a number of satellites sure. to keep track of. So the user interface, uh, uh, method that we used, or paradigm we used for that, we're also using in Cosmos. <laughs> There's a crossover between between space and games. And if you want to see uh, podcast 172, uh, which Trevor did for spacegamejunkie.com, you can look that up on spacegamejunkie.com. This is Trevor Sorensen, a doctor of engineering uh, at the Space Flight Lab and SOAS uh, and, and the College of Engineering at UH Manila. Thank you so much, Trevor. Thank you. It's really been great. Pleasure to be here. Thank you.